Hello everyone, I'm Adrian Hearn, the designer of Who is Nature, the interactive film that we'll explore today. So on behalf of Sons of Mercury, the University of Melbourne, Harmonic Whale Studios, and the Cultural Association of Cuban Heritage, welcome to this event for the Being Human Festival. The event is being broadcast both on Zoom and on Facebook Live. And the RSVP list indicates that you are joining us from around the world, the UK, Australia, across the Americas and elsewhere. Many of your countries are fortunate, just like Australia, to have the opportunities to engage with First Nation communities and build partnerships for more inclusive and I would say holistic ways of life. So for those of you who may not be uh, in Melbourne or from Melbourne, it's important to know that the University of Melbourne is located on land connected with the Wurundjeri First Nation community. My Aboriginal colleagues who were involved in creating this film, Kucha Edwards and Steve Kelly, point out that their communities have for millennia cared for the land and interacted with it, but never have they sought to own it as later settler communities did and still do. This is worth keeping in mind as we discuss the main question of this encounter today. Who is nature? Well, we've set up this session so that if you're joining us on Zoom, you can raise your hand at any time with questions or comments and we'll invite you to speak. Of course, you can type in the chat window too. And if you're on Facebook Live, you're welcome to post any comments or questions, which our technical team will feed through to me so that I can respond. Well, I'll um, take you into the film in just a moment and show you how to find it online. But first, I just want to um, kind of say something about why we created the film to begin with. When we commenced the project two years ago, just before COVID in Mexico, Cuba and Australia, we began by asking community leaders a question. What does nature mean to you? Now, their responses varied, of course, because they're from different cultures, but they had one thing in common. Everybody responded in a way that described nature not as a what, but as a who. What they were telling us is that nature is alive, that planet Earth is alive, and it's a very interesting perspective. If we accept it, then we can no longer treat the Earth as simply a resource for extraction. Instead, because the earth is alive, we need to build relationships with it. Of course, this is not new to anyone who sits quietly by a river or maybe listens to the wind blowing through the leaves of a tree. These personal experiences of meditation are a window into the exchanges with nature that we can have every day. And this is something that I think really underlines even the debates that have happened over the past two weeks in Glasgow around the COP summit. I suspect if people started to see nature as a living entity that they could engage with, they would see nature therefore less as a resource to be extracted. One can only hope, and I hope that films like this help to kind of bring voice to that cause. So the film reminds us of this, and I'm gonna show you then how to enter into it. I'm just gonna share my screen to do that. So we'll just go over here. Here we have just a blank Google search bar. So if you type in who is nature, uh, you can just select it there, click on it, and it'll come up. Um, now, there's a bit of background here on this page about the project. There's also a, uh, a few versions of it that you can look at. So the top version there says watch in medium resolution on any device, as you can see there. Now that's great for looking at with a mobile phone because you don't need really high resolution to do that or on a tablet. If you wanna get a slightly clearer picture or look at it on a bigger screen, then this version here in high resolution is the one you wanna go for. That's also enabled for a VR headset. Uh, whether that be an Oculus or uh, whatever headset you have, or putting a you know your phone into a Google Cardboard or something like that. So that's the one for the VR experience or a kind of slightly more rich view on a flat screen. 
Uh, we have it also on the Veer app, which is really popular in, in Asia. So we've, we've especially created that version for Veer. And then down here, I just want to point out these related resources that go into a bit more depth on why we did the project and really insights from the people themselves who are in the film, right? They've written up their experience of being in it, why they wanted to be in it, what the purpose is of the film. There's also here something I, I really want to point out. This is the soundtrack that we've created together with uh, Uncle Kutcher Edwards and a Grammy Award winner, Daniel Hauregi of Harmonic Whale Studios. And really we've created this as a kind of meditation. It's a soundtrack that you can put on and meditate to. It takes features from the film and has put them together into a kind of soundscape, a journey. And that's on those platforms that you can see there. And that's on the Sons of Mercury website. So feel free to have a look at the website. The reason I mention that now is that when we go into the film, you're not going to hear that. I'm going to mute, I'm going to mute the soundtrack so that I can kind of explain what we're seeing as we go in. So as we go through, feel free to post any observations or comments, or uh, if you're in the Facebook live event, then feel free to do it that way. So this is what you'll see when you go in. Okay, so here we are in the opening page of Who is Nature. You'll see on the top left there, there's a prompt to download the film. You can do that if you use the Chrome browser, Google Chrome browser on a computer, and then you can watch it, you know, without needing to be online. I've already done that, as you can see. But let's go in and, and check out the scenery. We begin here at the, um, on a beautiful day in Yucatan Peninsula in, in Mexico. And this is a really magical place called the Cenote Tsukan. And uh, just the technical point here, you can obviously zoom in and out, look around left or right. If you're wearing a headset, obviously just turn your head left or right. And you'll see these controls down underneath you. And they explain how the film works, how to interact with it. And that, um, that, that interaction happens by way of buttons that are going to appear in every scene. So you can feel free to click on interviews, maps, and some textual information that's going to appear in each of the scenes. But as we go down the, uh, the, the staircase here at the Cenote Tsukan, really what we're doing is more than moving our bodies here. We're actually moving into an intermediate space, the external space, the outside world of everyday life. And as the Mayan community leaders explain it, we're coming forwards here into a spiritual realm. This is what they describe as the womb of the earth. The womb of the earth, meaning that this is a place that's rich with insights about the earth's nature, the earth's character, and how we can interact with it. And so, as we enter into that and, and have a look around, if you're worried about swimming, then maybe you want to sit down if you get to this part, particularly with the goggles on. But as you look around the Cenote Tsukan, you know, you'll see this, uh, this, this control bar appear underneath you here. And that has those buttons with the, the map to tell us where we are, right, in Yucatan Peninsula. It also has some information about how the Mayan community understands cenotes. And, you know, this is, this is an important point because really to, to get the significance of this, we need to go back sometime in history, about three and a half thousand years. And that's what Leticia explains here, Leticia Renteria, a Temascal community healer. And she tells us about cenotes, that, that they are places for reflection literally and spiritually. So when you look down into a cenote, it gives you the chance to reflect not only on your relationship with nature, but actually your relationship with yourself. And that's a key point to understand ourselves as part of nature. It's one of the messages that comes through in a place like the cenote Tsukan. Here we are at a different part of the Tsukan sanctuary uh, where, where herbal medicine and other plants are produced. 
And here, that, those plants, again, have a long history of use in the Mayan community. Okay, and to explain that, we, we take a journey here with one of the community leaders here, Carlos Tuntun. And Carlos explains to us that his project here at the, the Tucan Sanctuary is to raise some public awareness about this history, to build bridges so that people understand that you know these plants are there as a resource for themselves and not just for their own health but for collective health to understand and appreciate the history to engage with people right to to build up relationships that are are really valuable for everybody involved including the natural world here we are in havana i'm just jumping ahead so i don't take too long obviously you can go at your own pace but here the babalaos the healers are asking permission to enter the forest and they've just received permission by way of throwing the coconuts and seeing which way they fall so with that permission mickey alfonso is now here he's cutting plants ewe is the name in yoruba tradition afro-cuban tradition and in return for cutting ewe the plants to bring home he offers something in return Come to that in just a sec. I, I want to show you the, the map here as well. Interestingly, the this place, the Bosque de La Habana, is not in the countryside. This is actually a, a kind of natural sanctuary. You see there it's kind of surrounded by, um, by a built-up environment in the middle of Havana. Uh, and it's used by people like Mickey Alfonso for exactly this purpose. Now, what they're doing here, as they extract plants, they give two things in return. They give songs, look at the bottom paragraph there, they give songs in return to each specific plant. And they also, they throw coins that contain copper to replace the minerals that they extract. And you'll see him do that in, in just a second here. But the point is that this is an exchange. It's not an extraction. There's a conscious recognition here that you can't just take, you have to give back as well. You see, he's asking his colleague there to throw the coin in to replenish the nutrients that are taken out. And that's, you know, in a way, the key message that as these community leaders go about, you know, engaging with nature for their own benefit, they're also giving something back to nature as they do it. Um, I'm just going to jump ahead here to, uh, to, to a sort of um, in a way, an extension of this tradition, an extension of it to Australia. Gold Coast, as you can see there. This is a, a Cuban festival. So Cuban knowledge extended into Australia through people like Adrian Medina, who's going to speak with us in just a moment. You can see him there, actually, right in the middle. And this is the Afrequete Festival, which happens every year in Eastern Australia on the Gold Coast. Um, you, you can see underneath, as always, there's a, a, you know, a map to show you exactly where we are on the Gold Coast. And, um, and, and what we learn here is that, you know, the, uh, the energy of nature is expressed and kind of vitalized, brought to the surface through the music and the dance. It's that energy that brings it to life and enables us to engage with it. It's a kind of common ground, if you like having the music and the dance. That's where we are. That's where we are here on the Gold Coast in Australia. And again, we have some information about the arrival of Cuban people and the traditions that they've brought with them to Australia. The journey of the drum, as, as the, uh, the festival puts it. So um, there's a bit of information about how Cubans arrived here uh, in the early 2000s, the same time that I moved to Australia from Madison, Wisconsin. And in that experience, Cubans have brought with them a sense of engagement with nature. Of course, they have in common this philosophy with the First Nation communities who are involved in the festival in the Gold Coast. Christina there is explaining why she put this festival together. And there's Adrian who uh, describes why it's important to recognize the features of the landscape in Afro-Cuban spiritual practice. And you'll see uh, Adrian is very good at explaining things and he'll do just that in, in a moment when we come out of the film. 
But remember this point, it's the drums, it's the dance, right? It's these things that come together to animate the relationship. You need to have a point of convergence, right? And that's what, that's what the arts can do. I'm jumping ahead here to Western Australia, the other side of Australia, to explore the Bimara Dreamtime story. I'm just going to pause for a second to explain that this story is a sacred story of my colleague Steve, Steve Kelly, who made this film with us. And you'll see Steve in just a moment. It's from the Murchison River area where the Nanda community lives. This place is known as Nature's Window in, um, you know, in, in, the, uh, in the Western terminology, kind of Euro European derived terminology but it has much greater significance than a tourism site. Here we see Bimara the serpent going through and filling the ravine with water, filling it up, creating the Murchison River and creating the landscape. The story goes that Bimara did that and then got scared by a huge wave. You can see the wave kind of threatening Bimara there and then descended down. I should mention that Victor Holder, an amazing animator from Venezuela, put this together with us. And I think Victor is here. Afterwards, Victor, if you're here, you're welcome. I'd love to hear what you might reflect about this. But the point of the Bimara story really, well, there are a number of points to it. It's a very rich story. But one of the key features that Steve explains here in his interview is that Bimara not only filled the land with water, Bimara enabled people to survive and still does. That's the key point, still does. Because when Bimara was scared by the waves, she went downwards into the earth and she left in her wake pools of fresh water. And so for tens of thousands of years, Steve's community uses these pools of water, these resources. Those are some of the waves there, similar to what might have scared Bimara. And there's Steve explaining the process. Um, and so when Bimara went down and disappeared, she left behind these pools like that one there and therefore steve's community has known for thousands of years how to access the water where to find it and you can see in the text here that he explains that knowing the dreamtime story is like a map right a living map this is not an artifact of history of the past this is an ongoing relationship with nature that his community maintains and you know is steward of. You can see Bimara there kind of descending into the, the ground, leaving pools of water. We come out of the womb of the earth towards the end of the film here. I'm just jumping ahead and reflect a bit on what it is we've learned. As with any ceremonial experience, the insights don't end when the ceremony ends, right? We bring them with us. That's a key point in so many traditions. Don't divide things, let things overlap with each other. Let ourselves ask the question, who is nature? And bring the insights with us. And the community leaders put it like this, in these words, in their words, absolutely everything, oxygen and life, our best ally, history and energy, the dreaming, we are nature. Maybe that's a good starting point for really considering the question, we are nature, in a way it's, where we began in the cenote, right? Looking down into the depths and considering how uh, we get a reflection, not just of nature, but of ourselves. We've included in here a, uh, a link to resources that you can look up and, um, you know, and go and explore the places a little bit that were involved and the people involved in the film. Notice it says for more detailed texts and readings, see the flat screen version. That was that first version I saw. And the reason for that is that we found many of our students like to use their phones or um, tablets. And so in that flat screen version, the lower resolution version, uh, you can scroll through the information. And we've included a bit more information there on the background of the stories uh, and also included references to literature about all of this in case people want to use this as an educational resource. And so as we come to the end, just a reminder as well to consider the, or go and have a look at the soundtrack produced by Harmonic Whale uh, together with Sons of Mercury. That's intended as a meditation. You can close your eyes and go on this journey with us. 
And there's the key insight. The Earth's health is intimately linked to the ecological wisdom of First Nation peoples. Well, I'm going to stop my screen sharing here and come back to you. Hopefully you can see me again. And so that gives a sense of, of you know, what you can find in the film. And you're welcome to go ahead and explore that uh, at your own pace. I think at this point, it would be a good idea to, you know, ask Adrian Medina uh, and Victor, if you're here as well, to, to say a few words about your roles in the film and reflect on the key question, who is nature? Adrian, please, over to you. Yeah, as I say, you know, it's a very, very interesting project. And, uh, and I'm gonna reflect in the, in the section where we went to Cuba, obviously being Cuban and being an Afro-Cuban priest, um, that is probably one of the most in, important part. Um, and before we do that, let's try all to get together into, into nature. Let's try to get to connect with nature in the way we do it best, which is singing. All right. So I will invite you guys here in the platform, also in Facebook, to unmute yourself. And we're going to ask permission, all right, to be able to get into the jungle, be able to get into the forest. And we're going to ask permission to a deity called Osain. All right. So I don't really care if your voice is not like Michael Jackson or like Beyonce, all right? It's not about the voice, it's not about the energy, right? And doesn't really matter if your pronunciation is not the best either. All right, can we all do that, please? All right, so just follow me. Guru, guru, bete. Guru, guru, bete. Mari wo sign, mari wo ye, mari wo. Marie 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 Guru, guru, bete, Marie 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 in, in, in Afro-Cuban um, spirituality and religion, um, everything around you is, is your teacher. So everything that you have come into contact with can teach you something. Um, and in this case, you know, we don't really look at nature as just a plant or just a, an environment that you are surrounded with, rather than a place where your presence and your energy can create um an emotion can create an interaction can create a living experience and that is what nature is everything that is surround that you are surrounded with that create an interaction and an emotion when you look at music for example um i'm just looking at the drum at the bata drum because the, the bata drum was mentioned there um a drum is made out of wood um it's made out of um animal parts, obviously you got the skin, um, you look at some strings, and at times you see some drums that are put together by metal. So you got very different um, elements that are in nature that are putting together an instrument. But when the percussionist plays the drum, the, percuss the percussionist is just playing the drum with an intention, with an emotion, with an energy. That energy creates music. And that specific music creates an emotion for the people that are listening to the music. So when you're looking at music, a percussion is playing music, for example, is that it's all those natural elements put inside one instrument played by somebody else that create an emotion. How many times have you listened to a specific track or specific music that made you cry or made you reflect about something in your life or make you smile? All right. So all nature as in, in, in the way of a drum played by somebody else's create an interaction within yourself create an emotion within yourself and that emotions make you meditate into what is it that you wanted to do with your life what is it what you want to do with your loved ones what is it that you want to do with your neighbor so we look at nature in that specific way so everything and everyone around you will create an emotion and will make you move forward in life so um, in this case, for Osain and the herbs, um, you know, I remember my uh, late grandmother, um, 
when I used to get sick, I was a very sick child with asthma and a lot of allergies. And many times I didn't even get the chance to see the doctor because my grandmother would say, just go downstairs and pick up so and so and so herb and so and so so and just make a tea and everything disappeared. So natural medicine in Cuba is extremely important. Um, you know, we, and I guess that comes from the, the Yoruba on the African tradition, um, especially the Yoruba tradition. So nature has a lot to teach us in terms of where, in terms of, if you're looking at plants, where plants live, how plants survive in a specific environment. And it is, it is says that, you know, so many people say, I'm not really good at, you know, planting a rose or looking after, after a specific plant. Um, or I'm not really, really good at gardening. And it's not that you're not really good at gardening and you are not a, um, a person that study, you know, um, to be a farmer it is just that perhaps the plant that you're trying to grow in your garden is not really connecting with your environment and sometimes the environment is not the soil sometimes the environment that is not connected to this yourself so there is there is a a, a great relationship between yourself again and then going back into what i said before between yourself and your environment because yourself you yourself your nature have a look at your relationship with the people around you. Have a look at the, the connection within yourself, the voice of your, your, the tone of your own voice. Sometimes your relationship with yourself, it is not allowing you to um, connect properly with the environment that you are. So in this case for Cuba and for the Oceanistas, um, you know, be able to sing, be able to ask permission to get into the into the forest, be able to to have an exchange between yourself and your surrounding. In this case, plants to be able to make ogun. Ogun means medicine in Yoruba. So ogun is the actually deity, uh, but ogun is medicine in Yoruba language. Um, and, and and have an exchange. I'm going to cut a specific plant to be able to create medicine to be able to help somebody else. Um, but medicine is not necessarily for to cure the disease. Um, we're looking at plants, um, use plants to be able to make medicine to cure a specific disease. Sometimes it's not just a physical disease. The most important disease that we need to fight within ourselves is our own ego and our own interaction with the open environment. And that is what we're looking at. Right. I'm going to ask permission to jump, to get into a domain, a science domain. I'm going to ask the permission to interact with the plants. I want to give something in return. Um, at the end of the day, the end resource that I would love to have is a balanced energy within myself to be able to coexist with my surroundings. And that is pretty much what I take about all this, um, this scene. And again, when you look at music, when you're looking at, you know, putting yourself in a beautiful um, Gold Coast, so if a paradise, you've got a beautiful surrounding at the beach, those who like to go to the beach, even just go for a, for a joy ride, just pushing a bicycle and you have to, that beautiful breeze, you know, hitting your face and your, in your, with your bicycle, that can interact, that can change your energy completely and that can change the energy around you um, just because your connection, your, your interaction and your emotion uh, within nature and that's, that's what is magical. Adrian, thank you so much for your thoughts on that. I've realized as you were speaking, you know, that you're talking about thinking of our own tone of voice, our own state of mind when we go out into the world. And, you know, for me, I think, as I think about the inspiration for the film, why we made it, you know, I know that the, the small group of us that began before it turned into a big thing, it was really just sitting around and discussing the way we feel when we sit next to a river and just listen, you know, just listening to the sounds around you. Here in Melbourne, the Merry Creek is a very accessible place right in the middle of the city. Anybody can get to the Merry Creek. You don't even have to go that far. You can just go outside and listen to the wind going through the, you know, the, the leaves of a, of a tree. 
I think the, the point is, is just to maybe listen a bit more and maybe talk a bit less. And because of course, any, any exchange that we're going to have requires two-way dialogue. And that can't happen if we're always talking. Um, so thanks Adrian for your thoughts there. Victor, I think is joining us on Facebook live rather than zoom. So I think he's, um, he's uh, posting there rather than, you know, going to come on and, and speak with us in person here. Um, speaking of which, I'm going to just drop in the chat for you the link to the Facebook live event. I've just done that. The reason for that is that, you know, we're not going to be able to do justice to the questions that are coming in in this session. And in a way, it's an opportunity for us to sustain a dialogue about these things over the coming days and weeks. So um, Facebook is a, you know, despite its many flaws, don't get me wrong, but Facebook is a good uh, platform because it enables us to sustain our conversation amongst, you know, the people who are here today uh, for an indefinite amount of time. So I anticipate that for the next few weeks, we can continue to have some exchanges about these issues and we can post other resources there as well. So do feel free to join that conversation on the on the Facebook live page where we're also going to take um, all of the questions that have come in here um, through Zoom and put them there on the Facebook page so that we can um, respond to them more fully. There are a few questions that I, I see have come in and, and just to, as I have a sort of scan of them, there are a few quite interesting ones there. Um, Paige asks, have we considered engaging other First Nation communities besides the ones that we do in the film? And I mean, you know, yes, of course we have. And, and COVID happened right as we finished doing the filming in Mexico. So we were lucky just to be able to speak with the people we did. But actually next on the agenda, next on my kind of vision of this was to go and um, work with people in China. China is a place I've spent several years living and learning language and just trying to learn about traditions that as well in China go back a really long time, thousands of years. Now, would you say Chinese people are first nation people? Well, I mean, that opens up a whole range of interesting questions about how we understand what a first nation community is. But I would say that for the purposes of what we're talking about, really the, 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 the intention here is to gain insight into traditions that have developed a dialogue with nature over a sustained period of time. You know, whether that be from people who have lived in a certain place for thousands of years, or whether it be, as in the case of Cuba, um, a community that was brought from somewhere else, right? The Yoruba community brought from West Africa um, and about 2 million Yoruba people brought to Cuba. And that being the case, you know, it's natural that that community should investigate its own roots and study and hold on to identity and develop and explore and enrich the insights that come back from thousands of years of tradition, going back to the Oyo Empire in Nigeria, what's now Nigeria. So I would say that um, in response to, to, to you, Paige, I'm, I, I think that we should be asking these questions amongst everybody, you know, anybody and everybody that has connected themselves with a sustained tradition of dialogue with nature. There are real insights to be learned from that. And this is something students have responded well to. I see a question there from Rachel about student reactions to this. Interestingly, one of my students made a very good point after we looked at this in class. You know, this is, uh, they, they all had the headsets on. We had a series of headsets available to them. And they put the headsets on when we were just making the film. It wasn't in its final version yet. And, uh, and one of the students said in our discussion, hang on a minute, this is kind of uh, paradoxical. You're teaching us about nature by making us stare at a screen. <laughs> and I thought that was a very good point, that really the end, the end, the purpose is not the technology. Rather, what I'm hoping is that the technology in the film may inspire people to take off the headsets 
to put down the tablet and to put down the phones and go out and actually get much better entertainment and fulfilling dialogue from a tree or a river or a leaf or a blade of grass. Because the insights there, I think, are much deeper. And if you're patient with them, um, can, can really speak in a much more meaningful way. And so it's as my colleague, Daniel Hauregi puts it, director of Harmonic Whale, really the technology is the medium. It's just the medium. The message is behind it. And the message is the important thing, right? And it's, it's an important thing to remember, right? That we don't want to kind of promote this as a, uh, as a finished work, as something that people can go and do and then put it down and be done with it. This is, this is supposed to just open a little crack in our thinking, a little doorway that we could walk through and then go and explore these things for ourselves. Maria Teresa indicates that she has um, relatives in Brazil who have um, you know, some knowledge of natural healing and plants and that many of them are, are quite knowledgeable about this. And, um, you know, I, I think uh, I, I do too. I'm, you know, my mother's side is Brazilian. And on that side, my relatives, my cousins over there, I remember when I met my cousin for the first time, she said to me, and I didn't know quite how to respond. She said to me, Adrian, do you hug trees? <laughs> do you hug trees? And I thought that, you know, I didn't really quite have the words, but she said, come on, let's go and hug a tree. And I thought, oh man, really? <laughs> in the middle of the public park, we went and hugged a tree and were patient. We stayed there long enough to actually feel a connection. And I thought, you know, this is, this is just a perfect example of how not to um, jump to conclusions and judgmental, um, you know, positions on these things and give them a chance to breathe, give these things a chance to breathe. Um, and so I would say, Maria Teresa, that you know, those of us who have relatives who have some background in natural healing, what a great resource. What a wonderful resource. We need to talk with these people more. We often talk about how we don't engage with relatives enough. And sometimes when we realize it, it's too late, right? That our uncles and aunts, even our parents, our grandparents have passed on and we miss the opportunity. Well, you know, I, I would say that this is a good topic to discuss. This is a good bridge to open um, conversations. Ellie supports me here. She is, as she says, a, I'm an out and proud tree hugger. I appreciate that, Ellie. I appreciate your, your, uh, your affirmation as I hug trees as well. Um, Paige says, when you eventually come to the New England region, I'll have to bring you to Walden Pond. Uh, Paige, where's Walden Pond? Uh, that would be in Concord, Massachusetts. Uh, very famously, there was a book written about Walden Pond called Walden, or A Life in the Woods, written by a guy by the name of Henry David Thoreau, who basically wrote a lot about what you're saying, but in the 1850s. Um, so there's been a very long history, not only within indigenous communities, but also within you know, settler communities of connecting with nature as well. Um, and through Thoreau and his friend Emerson, uh, in America, there started, you know, the environmental movement um, to be closer to nature, to connect more so with nature. Well, thanks, Paige. I can't wait to visit that place. And, you know, I think the point you make there is a good one that uh, is sort of along the lines of what I was saying. People that have dwelt on this and spent time thinking about it, these are resources that we have to engage. It's not about essentializing this as purely the domain you know, uh, uh, of First Nation communities. Of course, First Nation communities have historical insights into this that we have to, you know, appreciate and, and you know, maybe even stand in awe of and, and certainly try to engage with. But I think um, everybody would agree that where this knowledge is held is where we need to go and have these conversations and be conscious of history as we do it. Adrian Medina, you have your Hand up, please. Go ahead. You don't need to put yeah. your hand up, Adrian. Jump in. No, no, it's, it's all right. It's all right. Um, as I say, you know, um, everything is about, you know, connection and energy, pretty much all about energy. And, um, and I'm going to give you an example. Um, at the beginning, I asked you guys to sing with me, right? Now, we're going to do it again. And after we sing it, 
I'm gonna just point out a few, um, few points. So you guys, and you're gonna sing twice, right? We're gonna sing it again, we're gonna sing once, and then we're gonna sing twice, and I'm gonna give you a few points. And you're gonna see how your energy is gonna change completely. Do you remember the song? Kuru, kuru, bete, marivo, sai, marivo, ye, marivo, kuru, kuru, bete, marivo, sai, marivo, ye, marivo. All right, my question is, how do you feel? What I can see um, in some of the faces that I can see in front of me, uh, we either worry about following the song, worry about you looking great in front of the camera, <laughs> or you are pronouncing the words properly. Uh, some, um, some of the people that study music might be like, is he in the right key or no? Is he in the right tempo? All right. Um, but what we forgot is how do we feel now that we ask permission to enter the domain, to enter nature? And nature has granted you permission to get inside. How do you feel? Is it any more about how you sound? Is it any more about the singing? Or is it all about your connection now that you enter the domain? How do you feel now that you've been granted permission? How is your connection now that, you, that you're walking through that beautiful forest or, that be or you're swimming in that beautiful lake or you're, walking, or you're walking through that beautiful desert? So how do you actually feel now that you've been granted permission. Now that you know what I'm looking at, I would love you to sing the song again. And imagine that you're asking permission to walk into that domain. You have been granted that permission. And now you are in the middle of that beautiful environment and you're about to start changing your energy and your communication or your, your, your fears, your sadness, your happiness in that environment. And now I want you to really focus on that more than trying to say or to sing the songs uh, in the best possible way. Can we try that again? All right. So, Kuru, Kuru, Bete, Mari, Wo, Sai, Mari, Mari, Wo, Kuru, Kuru, Bete, Sai, Mari, Wo, Mari, Wo. All right. So, if you were in the jungle, how do you feel? Do you actually could hear the birds? Could you actually smell the trees? Could you actually uh, feel, uh, if you're working with, walking with no shoes, can you actually feel the grass? Can you actually feel the ground? Can you actually you have a connection with the breeze around you? If you were in the ocean, could you actually feel how warm the water was or how cold? Because you might be in Antarctica. Ocean is the ocean. No, so, and, that, and that is what we are trying to reflect, trying to reflect our real emotion, our real connection with your env environment and have a positive um, effect into our surroundings to be able to connect and have a dialogue with um, with a you know, with that beautiful environment, with a beautiful, uh, if you are surrounded by people, with the beautiful people that are around you. So just to remove the physical contact and go deeper into the emotional contact that you have with nature. So my question with you would be, for you guys would be, what is nature for you? Who is nature for you? And what is your connection with nature? So feel free to put it on the chat. Those who are watching on Facebook, uh, please feel free to enter the debate and talk. Um, what is nature for you? And how do you feel once you enter into that nature? I like the response that Carolina has just put in there to your question, Adrian. <laughs> she writes, I am nature. And I think that's, that's one of the, the key things here. I, in fact, I would say that, you know, unless we understand ourselves as nature, we cannot be human, right? I think it's a very fitting insight for this festival, the Being Human Festival, right? And so the Being Human Festival asks, what is it to be human, a human being? How can you be human as a human being? Well, I don't think it's possible to be human unless we recognize that we ourselves are nature. In a way, I think it gives us a grounding, a sense of our feet being on the ground, and, and I guess a sense of kind of confidence in, in what we are as people. Without that, I think we end up incomplete. And so to be human, I think we have to be nature as well. 
Um, I, I see we're coming towards the end here, and I, I wanted to mention that there are some other really interesting events on this very theme going on in the Being Human Festival. Um, you probably know that the Being Human Festival is uh, run out of the UK, but it's partnering with institutions around the world, including the University of Melbourne. And here at the University of Melbourne, we have an event, which I'm planning just to drop in and, and watch tomorrow, that's very much aligned with this topic of who is nature. And so um, tomorrow there's an event from 12 to 2.30 called The Old New, Contemplating Country Today. And uh, it's an event with five First Nation community leaders that explain the meaning of nature from their perspectives and the perspectives of their communities. I think this is a really kind of tremendous opportunity to learn, just as we've been speaking about. To find the information to that, oh, I, thanks for that. Maria Teresa has just put up the, uh, the link there in the chat. You can find all of the Being Human uh, Festival activities there. Um, and uh, remember, thanks Mire for putting up the, uh, the Facebook uh, link there as well, that you can join the conversation with us there. Um, I, look, I really wanna thank as well the team, the technical team that's made this event run so smoothly behind the scenes, because as we all know from the last two years of online interactions, things go wrong usually, especially when they're not supposed to. So Eli, Mireille, uh, Maria Teresa, the, the team here in Melbourne, um, thank you so much for joining us through this, through this event. And Adrian Medina, of course, has played a, a kind of invaluable role in, um, in, in, you know, in the film and in many events that we've done about the film. And I just hope that this is a starting point again to get off the screens really, to get off Zoom and to go outside and, and find for ourselves, you know, the, the meaning of nature, who is nature. Um, Adrian, is there anything you'd like to say just to wrap up? Um, I will send you the song, guys, so you can learn the next time we just, just meet together, all right? <laughs> Maybe you can post a video in the Facebook um, event, Adrian, of you singing the song, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, again, uh, it's not about, it, it's all about energy. Who is nature? It's all about energy um, because we are a big part of it. Um, just next time that you are um, in any environment, just don't try to see the where you are at, it's just how you feel at that environment. And that is the key. So just try to try to feel it, trying to see it, um, trying to smell it, try to breathe it, try to talk with it. So that is that is the message behind it. You know? Um, rather than um, trying to be physical uh, with the environment, you are be just be emotional. Just pretty much just be in that moment and try to absorb and feel that moment um, right here. And that's that's who is nature for me. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much. And thank you all for being here. I am now going to turn off my computer and go outside. I think that's where I need to be. So maybe I'll see you there. Thank you again for joining us for this, um, this uh, discussion, this exchange, which I hope we can continue online. All right. Until next time, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you.